This is the thing about Betty Broderick. She had what a lot of women have, is this picture in their mind of the romantic, fantasized, perfect life. You know, I call it the June Cleaver syndrome. And when anything is disrupted in that picture, and particularly when something is dis disrupted in the picture that has to do with your own husband and his feeling about you, you can't withstand it. And she was the classic defining example of that. Betty's life has changed drastically from a millionaire's wife to prisoner number W42477. These photographs taken on their wedding day in April of 1969 show a 21-year-old bride of striking beauty and her handsome young groom. Betty worked as a teacher to help pay the bills and put Dan through Cornell Medical School and Harvard Law School. Finally, their years of struggling paid off. Betty and Dan had four beautiful children, a five-bedroom home in a ritzy San Diego suburb and a ski condo in Colorado. Then, Dan hired Linda Colquina, a dazzling 22-year-old, to work as his legal assistant. Dan and Linda fell in love. After 16 years of marriage to Betty, Dan filed for divorce, and their breakup was vicious. Broderick versus Broderick began with a vengeance and ended in tragedy. On November 5th of 1989, just before dawn, a desperate Betty Broderick drove to the lavish home of her ex-husband. Betty went to the second floor master bedroom where she found Dan and his 28-year-old bride, Linda, asleep. She pulled out a revolver and showered the sleeping couple with bullets. Linda died instantly and Dan minutes later. Before Betty fled the house, she yanked their phone out of the wall. Betty's first trial ended with a hung jury, but her second trial finished with two second-degree murder convictions. She could spend the rest of her life in prison, and she has joined us from prison by satellite. Hello, Betty, how you doing? Hi, fine. I would like, if you can, to take us back to the kind of life that you, you had. You married, and for a while, certainly did appear to have the Beaver Cleaver family and Beaver exactly. Cleaver. Yes. Exactly, that's true. I thought, I thought we did have a perfect marriage. We had a lot in common. When we met, we were very happy together, and we had a lot in common. We had common goals. I wanted a large Catholic family, and he wanted to be very successful. I took those marriage vows, and I believe he did at the time, too, believing that we'd be together, and we'd work together, and we'd get through everything, and we'd build a life for ourselves so and what, our children. So, so when did you start to sense things were going wrong? Dan was never a womanizer. I never doubted where he was going. We had total trust in one another, as we should have, because we were committed. But in 1983, I noticed Dan at a party talking about some girl that he thought was really beautiful. And, I, and that was my first clue that Linda, Linda Colquina existed. Okay, and Lu Linda Colquina was the assistant that he'd hired for himself, is that he true? She was the receptionist in the law building where he worked, and uh -huh. then he subsequently, after becoming involved with her, hired her in September 83. Did you ask him if he was having an affair? Yes. And he said? Totally denied it and said I was imagining things and I was crazy and that Linda was a sweet, innocent young girl and there was absolutely nothing going on, never was. And oh, and by the way, your fat, old, boring, ugly, and stupid just started coming on the scene then. He was unhappy with everything in his life. He told you that you were fat and old and boring and stupid? He said yes, those words Yes, and he to didn't you? like our home, and he didn't like our children, and it was, to me, it was an absolute classic midlife crisis. Even and I dev devoured every book on the subject. To the point of even he got the red Corvette, is that true? Got the red Corvette, yeah. the risky business sunglasses, the scarf around his neck, the leather jacket. I told him he was the American joke. If only he would go to a, to a therapist of some sort. Uh, but he wouldn't. Now, and when he did... wouldn't, he never, he never um, admitted the affair. Why did you and carry the gun if you only wanted to talk? I did bring the gun as a way to make Dan and Linda listen to me. For the first time in this whole thing, I couldn't prevail in court, no matter what. Dan was the kingpin in this town legally. Well, I understand what you're saying, but, but Betty, two because people are every dead. Time, every time I went to his house to talk to him, and that's what I did every time he had me cornered, I went there to talk to him. And before, if he saw me coming, he'd call the police and have me arrested. But that morning, you took, you, the gun was in the car, 
You consciously took the gun out of the car. I you did. went up the stairs to talk to them and what happened? And to keep them from calling the police. I was going to make them listen and talk to me. I opened the door. It wasn't closed tightly. As I opened the door and entered, entered the room, Linda said, call the police. Dan went for the phone, and I screamed, no. And just the gun went off, and that's as fast as it happened. A lot of people have said that uh, Betty Broderick is a heroine because of, you know, she took matters into her own hand. To me, it seems, and maybe you will agree, Betty, that what you really did was you lost yourself. And you said at the beginning that you wanted a lot of women to understand how difficult the court system is. I think it's important for women to know that you don't give up your entire identity to someone else. Don't you think that's important, Betty? That's very important. But the way that I was raised, that's the way... That's what I was taught, is that love is putting the other person first and making the other person happier than you are. And I did. I put my children and my husband before myself, but I thought that was right. And I don't apologize for it, and I was happy that way. Are you sorry that you went there now? Are you sorry that you did it? Are you sorry? I'm sorry about this whole thing, but I'm mostly sorry that, that Dan Broderick chose to conduct our marriage and our family and his life the way he did. There was no reason for it, and it was brutality, and we didn't deserve that. We're here in front of the Central California Women's Facility. It's a prison that houses almost 3,000 female criminals, and one of their more infamous inmates is Betty Broderick. As I live my life, um, and some terrible things have happened to me in my life, I think, but I take absolute responsibility for all of it. I, see, I can see a pattern and a reason for every good thing and bad thing that has happened. I take absolute responsibility for everything I've ever done. I've never lied about it. I've never denied anything I've ever done. I've told the complete, absolute, total. There is no more truth than the truth that I've always told. That day, every day since, and today. I never made a conscious decision to ever hurt anybody, much less kill anybody. I never went there to hurt you. You with me on that? I Not hear even you. hurt anybody. Wait a minute. I Much hear less you. Kill people. I hear you, but I, I am trying. I That's why I'm this. sitting here. I'm okay. sitting here keeping you. <laughs> Look I, at I, this. Look at the real I, evidence and stuff. I, again, I don't know how much you. Yeah, know. I've read. I've read if a I lot. I went there as a person in control of the situation and of myself. Would it have transpired like that? I don't know. Hell no. I mean, I didn't even step in that room with two feet. One foot went in that room. They moved, I got scared, the gun went off, it was two bullets in the wall. I mean, is that a person that has control of anything? So, so I you... I mean, it was a, So, okay, here, here's another way of looking at it. I don't even remember ever pulling that trigger, even once, much less several times. That's the first thing I asked five the times, lawyer. Five times, five times. It's the first thing I asked the lawyer is, <clears throat> I mean, with this gun, can you just do that? And it... And he said, no. But I don't even remember doing that. I was just, I, I, you know, confronting him and asking him to stop and, and having that so that for what? the first time in my life, he couldn't say, you've got 10 seconds to get off my property, you're going to jail, which he did for about six or seven times over the years before that. He would never deal with me person to person. It had to be lawyer, courtroom, president of the Bar Association to pee on. That's how he would deal with me. Okay. I'm it hearing It made sense you? to me. Okay. I'm good. It made good sense to me. What made sense? Taking the gun so I could make them listen to me. It made perfect sense to me. Perfect sense. It makes sense to me now. And I came out of prison from the interview with her and just realized, oh, there's a woman who had everything, but everything was not really her own. She had everything, yet did not own herself because she had given herself away to her husband and the idea of the perfect life and therefore could no longer lead the perfect life. And that really helped me in a lot of areas because I, I started to understand women of all races and classes and socioeconomic backgrounds differently as a result of that interview with Betty Broderick.